a customer almost feels forced to say, how do you do that? Because I didn't tell them how. I didn't tell them, you know, why I did that. I, you know, I just said that I do this specific thing. Hey, podcast listener, you're about to discover insider tips, tricks, and secrets to making more sales and converting more prospects into customers with email marketing. For more information about the email marketing podcast or the autoresponder guy, go to dropdeadcopy.com slash podcast. Hey, it's John McIntyre here, the autoresponder guy. It's time for episode 98 of the McMethod email marketing podcast where you're really just getting actionable tips, tricks, and strategies on how to convert more leads into customers and uh, just make some more money. So if you like money, keep listening. Now today, I'll be talking to Matthew Pollard. Now, uh, Matthew is actually a fellow Aussie, so I really enjoyed doing this episode with him. It's always refreshing to get on the phone with someone who sounds like I used to sound like. Um, I've been told that I sound a bit more American these days. And uh, and just have a chat, you know, have a chat like two Aussies in a bar having a couple beers. So that's what today's about. And, uh, you know, Matt's really cool. Matthew's really cool because we've talked about, uh, he talks about rapid growth and uh, niche, niche marketing differentiation. So this is really how to stand out. Because because if you ain't standing out, if you're just fading into the background, it's going to be really hard to make sales. And this applies whether you're doing uh, you know, face-to-face stuff as clients or if you're selling products. You have to differentiate yourself. You must do it. Okay. Now, to get the show notes for this episode of the Email Marketing Podcast, go to themcmethod.com slash 98. Now... One thing I want to mention is uh, I think, you know, a lot of people come to me sometimes and they they talk about, uh, for example, McMaster's, right? The community that I have where there's a monthly fee and you get access to training and all that kind of stuff. And uh, sometimes people cancel and, you know, obviously. And, uh, you know, I've asked a few people why they cancel. And sometimes it's like, well, I hired a copywriter, so I don't need the training anymore. I'm like, well, did you know that I wrote copy? (laughs) And, uh, you know, what's been surprising is that, you know, half of the business, I I could say a good half of the Make Method business is client work. So that's where I get on the phone with you and we have a chat about your business and we talk about what you need in terms of whether it's emails or a sales funnel or split testing or or a sales page or whatever it happens to be that you need and uh, and I make it happen for you. So if you'd like to work with me personally, one-on-one, where we get on Skype, we talk about your project, you pay me and then I go and do the work for you, you uh, should email me because that's what I do and I do a damn good job and uh, so if you want to email me it's john at themakermethod.com and uh, we'll have a chat about that we'll get on the phone and talk it out so that's that now this week's McMaster's insight of the week is just copywriting right and I've mentioned this plenty of times this is a podcast that I've talked a lot about copywriting before but I just wanted to wrap on it real quick again because I've had a friend this past week who's been trying to email people and trying to get them on the phone he's redoing some of the messaging on his website he knows he should learn copywriting and he knows it's holding him back, but he's not doing it. He's not putting in the time or the effort to go and learn how to write copy because it's hard work. You know, you got to spend half an hour, an hour every morning learning how to write copy. You got to read the books, you got to study. He just doesn't want to do it. And for better or worse, well, you know, whether he likes to or not, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't change the fact that it's holding him back. So uh, the insight for this week is that. Learning copywriting, even if you're the business owner and you're not planning on writing too much copy, it's going to change the way you look at business and change the way you look at doing all that sales and marketing stuff. And it's one of the most valuable things you can learn. Seriously, it pays off in so many different ways. Uh, and this is why a lot of very successful entrepreneurs and business people are salespeople. You know, that's really what I call a copywriter is. A copywriter is just a salesperson who does it by hand or like writes it down instead of does it face to face. So copywriting, you have to learn it. Now, as for McMaster's, you might be wondering what the hell is McMaster's. It's a private training community that I have. There is a monthly fee, but that monthly fee gets you access to me inside the forum and the other members in there. And you also get access to a variety of different training, including the flagship McIntyre Method training course on the four. It's a four-week program on how to, you know, by the end of it, you'll have written a 10-email autoresponder sequence for your business that you've written, you control, you can change, update, modify, and improve at any time. So uh, there's a bunch of other stuff in there too, which you'll love. So that is that. If you want to learn more about that, go to themcmethod.com and follow the links in the menu to the McMaster's sales page. That is that for now. Let's get into this interview with Mr. Matthew Pollard. 
It's John McIntyre here, the Order is Funner Guy. I'm here with Matthew Pollard. Now, Matthew is a uh, rapid growth consultant. He's got a, uh, a sweet title here. I'm going to try and read it without stuttering. But he is a niche marketing differentiation and sales systemization coach. And he uh, basically helps you work out how your product and service is different. So in other words, he's a business coach and he's worked out how to differentiate himself by, by targeting a certain angle in the market. And why I thought uh, he'd be really interesting to chat to is that he's got some cool, uh, I think some quite unique ideas on how to come up with that. You're basically a USP. How are you going to differentiate yourself and stand out from all the other copywriters or all the other business coaches or all the other businesses that sell the same thing that you sell? Uh, and this is a really this is a key thing. Whether you're going to an event and trying to network with people, whether you're you know building a business and trying to sell you know kitchen knives, doesn't matter what you're doing. You have to stand out unless <clears throat> you want to compete on price, and that's really it's really just a fastest you know a race to the bottom. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Some of the how to do this elevator pitch, how to come up with that unique angle uh, and differentiate yourself, and then how that you know sort of where that's led uh, Matthew right now to go and do what he does with businesses, which is help them work this out, do some of this gross stuff, and do it rapidly. So. Can have some fun with it today, and he's Australian, so you're gonna hear another Aussie accent. We've been getting a few of these on lately, and it's uh, it's always nice, you know. I speak to a lot of Americans, and it's quite refreshing to get on the phone with uh, with an Australian. Funnily enough, he lives in Texas, which uh, I'll be there in a, a few weeks. So, anyway, Matthew, how you doing, man? I'm doing well, mate. Yourself? Fantastic. Good to have you on the show, man. Yeah, I'm excited to be here, man. Thanks very much for the awesome introduction. I'm glad you got it out without the stutter. <laughs> Oh, I just, uh, you know, I, I read it slowly and uh, carefully just to make sure it worked. I, 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 well, you, I, <laughs> you did well. You did. You gave it justice and you even managed to catch me out about differentiation in my title. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think what I do too is like, uh, I don't know if you do this on your podcast, but one thing uh, my friends have called me out on is I, I put on this, you might be able to hear it now, I put on this like podcast voice. It's like slightly different to the normal voice because it's sort of like when you're doing a show and you're doing interviews, you're doing anything recorded, you need to be a bit better with your diction, a bit better with your, you know, the way you phrase things and your speed and all those kind of things. <laughs> well, you're, you're Australian. You've got to learn to talk slowly. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing too, man, is if, if we talk like this, you know, how you going, mate? And you have that Australian accent. No one understands anything we're talking about. So, so it works way better when you kind of, de- you know, what's it, de- huh? take the Australian well, accent out of it a bit. You do. You can't. Otherwise, you'd have to call yourself the Bogan podcast. And again, I used an Australian, <laughs> Australianism to explain that. So... <laughs> A bogan, a bogan. Anyway, we should explain that sometime. But uh, before we do that, let's uh, give the listener a bit of a background on on who you are, what you do, and why you're special. Yeah, yeah, sure. So I guess my core, I guess when you were talking USP is what I am really, really good at is taking any idea and creating rapid growth underneath it. So I've done that. I've been responsible for, you know, five multi-million dollar startups myself, anything from telecommunications back when telecommunications was saturated. I created the fastest growing uh, independent telecommunications brokerage for independent mobiles in the country in Australia. And then, you know, just recently I, I, I worked in a, a marketing um, platform that actually got in three and a half thousand students into a, an RTO, which is like a the American version of a college. But you know, anything from national accredited education to telecommunications, I know how to turn something into a rapid growth vehicle. And you know, for something like education, especially, you would have thought that there are really intelligent people working in education because there's lots of teachers, there's lots of marketing strategists, and it takes years and years and years to get the first few hundred clients in education, yet we got three and a half thousand in three years. And it was purely because I can look at things from a different angle and I can teach other people to look at things from a different angle and allow them to differentiate in such a way and target a niche market that probably no one else has thought of. And that's why we get such great growth. Nice. I like it. That was a great pitch. (laughs) Well, it (laughs) You sold me as a differentiation and a sales strategist, mate. I felt that if I didn't sound good at the start, then people are probably going to think that I might not quite know what I'm talking about. That's true. That's true. One thing I've noticed is talking to, like looking at Australians and Americans and different people from different cultures, is Australians typically, I don't think, you, I don't think you've got this issue, but Australians, a lot of Australians have trouble selling themselves. We're a bit more like, we do it off the back foot a bit more. We're a bit hesitant to, you know, we have that tall poppy syndrome. You don't want to be better than anyone. Whereas I've noticed that Americans, and it's particularly when you spend time, like I know when I spend time with Americans, is they're much more forthcoming about what they're good at, generally. I could be wrong, but the ones I've met are like that. And uh, oh, that was look, I, I'd, I'd agree with that. 
Yeah, look, I'd, I'd agree with that. I mean, I think that, and especially in Australia, you'll always downplay yourself because everybody wants to be the little the, the Aussie battler, if you like, to use a, a an equilocalism. But mm. that you know, everybody doesn't want to seem better than their friends. Everybody just wants to fit in. But what actually happens is that they're not promoting themselves. And a lot of times, for instance, when I put myself forward and what I do, a lot of times people will say. Oh, good, great. I'm glad you you mentioned that because you know I'm really struggling. I've got a business; it's been running for ten years, and you know I just no matter what I do, I know I don't seem to grow, and I'm always struggling to. I've lost a customer, then I've got a customer, and I you know I'm just surviving. Mm. And I'm glad you actually put yourself forward because now I can utilize your service and get some advice. Where by not presenting yourself in the right way, you actually are doing people a disjustice because you know you're good at what you do. Why wouldn't you tell people so that they can use you? Mm. Mm. That's such a critical mindset issue that you know, it takes a long time to get this idea where, where if you're in business or if you're selling anything, assuming the product's good or the service is good, then you really owe it to not just yourself to go and make the money, but to, to the marketplace to go and help them. Because if it's a great product, they're missing out if you don't sell it right. Look, I agree with you. And it, it's funny because over the last few weeks, I, I was a pitch coach and judge at Google Startup Weekend just this weekend. And the weekend before that, I was a pitch coach pitch coach and judge at the Microsoft event. And the amazing thing is these pe- some of these people that are involved in these events have unbelievable ideas. Like, I wish I could be a shareholder in some of these ideas that these people are coming up with. But when they tell me about it, I'm like, I'm not interested at all. Hmm. And then they tell me about who it helps and how it helps them. And I'm like, wow, this idea is amazing. How do we get involved in this? How do we get moving with it? And all it is, is they're talking to me like a coach would. I'm a business coach. They're telling me about the features of the service that they offer. They're not telling me any story for why it works. Mm. And over, you know, the Google Startup Weekend is a great example. I spent, you know, you work with them over a three-day weekend. And by the end of it, they have this clean-cut pitch. And I look, I was one of the judges for that as well. And, I you know, I got to see the transition from when they first told me about their idea where, you know, I you know they were excited about it, but half their team didn't even understand what they were doing to the last day where an audience of 150 people in, in the back end are like, oh, my God, these ideas are unbelievable. Mm. And it's really just about learning how to present it in a way where you – a, demonstrate the need or tell a story about a specific customer about, you know, who it helps and then take them through a story of how you came up with an idea to help this person and then, you know, I like to say in chapters, chapter three, talk about how you created a certain product and show them the product and then step four or chapter four, talk about the financials and how big the market is to get the investors excited. Mm-hmm. And by follow, by simply, and you know, I gave them a four-step process, which is, very, very basic for scripting uh, a, a pitch, yet for them, it made such a phenomenal difference that, you know, the ones that followed those stepping stones or processes correctly, you know, it actually meant that they, I mean, the, one of the groups that I worked with won the event, but, you know, I worked with 12 of the 18, so I guess that's not really saying much. But, um, you know, such a major difference, and it's all about knowing how to present what you do in a way that isn't selling, isn't pushing, it's just educating by telling stories. Mm, I like it. I like it. So let's talk about that then, how to do this. I mean, because you've got that elevator pitch when you know, I'm in a conference and I bump into someone that might be a potential client. I've got to find a way to get across that. Basically, I'm a copywriter. I have a marketing agency, for example. But I've got to find a way. I mean, there's plenty of marketing agencies and copywriters and consultants and, and this kind of thing out there. So I've had to find ways to, to differentiate myself. And that applies in that situation. But it also applies at every level of that marketing process, whether it's you know a one-on-one thing or on a website or on, even on a billboard. So I'm assuming, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like this, like this way of coming up with like a, call it the elevator pitch, you know, you can apply it anywhere. You really can. And, and it should be applied everywhere because realistically, you create a business to provide a core benefit. And an elevator pitch is really talking about the benefit that you provide. You also provide that benefit to a group of people. And in your elevator pitch, you talk about the group of people that you help. And generally, the customers that you've had in the past probably had a few objections that they needed to answer before they took you on as a client, uh, sorry, as, as, as their consultant. So why not put that up front? So now it's funny, like in the, um, the Better Business Coach podcast, which we'll talk about in a second, you know, I, I, I break down a full elevator pitch and then in the next session, a conversational elevator pitch. But it's really quite simple, a, a basic elevator pitch. And I always start with clients teaching them this because they need to understand at a foundational level how basic it is and how simple it is to implement and just how mind blowing the change 
that you get from the response from the client can be from something that's purely scripted and is obviously scripted so that when we move to the next stage it's a little bit harder and a little bit more work you can see that it's going to add so much value to your business that makes it worth the effort so the primary function of an elevator pitch is you say i do x for sorry i do x for this group of people so what segment do i work with so i'm basically saying you know i work with struggling businesses and you know i then talk about the benefit or the problem that i solve so you know i help struggling businesses create rapid growth or avoid having huge numbers of customer complaints depending depending on what you're what you're pitching you know even if and this is where the common objection comes in you know even if they suck at sales or even if you know, they couldn't manage a process to save their life. You know, you come up with something that works. And what's funny is it's, it's, it's very simple. I, do th- I work with this group of people to fix this benefit or problem, sorry, to achieve this benefit or fix this problem, even if most common objection. You know, it's a three-step, very simple process. But as a result of doing that, a customer basically would, for- would almost feels forced to say, how do you do that? Because I didn't tell them how. I didn't tell them, you know, why I did that. I, you know, I just said that I do this specific thing mm. and it forces them to say, how do you do that? You know, if I say, you know, I work with struggling businesses to obtain rapid growth within their organization, even if they suck at sales, if somebody's got a struggling business, they're going to say, how do you do that? As opposed to if I say I'm a business coach, they'll say to me, oh, that's nice. I had a business coach before. Yeah, it didn't really work out. Or, oh, no, it's nice that you're a business coach. Um, I do this. And, you know, a good example of this, the best I can give you is somebody saying, I sell insurance. How does that make you feel? Oh, I've already got my insurance sorted out. Please don't talk to me. That's what happens, right? And it's the same when you say you're a coach these days because there are so many coaches out there and everybody knows that 95% of them, their biggest problem is that they can't get clients. So as soon as you hear, I'm a coach, you're like, oh, that's, a, that's the new code word for salesperson. So you run for the hills. Mm. So when you say, I help struggling businesses obtain rapid growth, even if they suck at sales, they're like, well, that's different. I haven't heard that before. How do you do that? Mm. And it just converts it completely into on their invitation now, I get to explain what I do. Where going back to the insurance salesperson, they'd say, oh, I've already got insurance. And then I'd have to say, But have you tried this or have you thought about this? Or what about if you looked at it from this way? Now I'm pushing my products and services on someone, Mm. which I know know Australians hate and I've now realized that Americans hate. They hate pushing themselves on people. And by doing it wrong, you are forcing yourself to do that. And I get people all the time to say, I don't like networking events. You know, you never get anything good out of them. And it's funny. I go to networking events all the time. And I, I really lo- enjoy the experience and I get lots of customers out of it because I, I ask people what they do to, to be interested in what they do. They tell me that they're a business coach or they tell me that, you know, they sell insurance. And I say, oh, that's cool. Like they expect to hear and then they expect me, you know, they then reciprocate by saying, what do you do? And I respond with a three-part elevator pitch. Well, actually now I respond with this conversational elevator pitch that I, I talk about in um, my podcast. But effectively, it, they then respond with, how do you do that? And then I get to sell to them on their invitation. So it's not that networking doesn't work. And it, it, it purely is that people are doing it wrong. And if you learn how to do it right, it makes such a change. And you and I were talking offline about, you know, the elevator pitches and the effectiveness of it. And a lot of people know that an elevator pitch exists, yet it still works so, so well because even though I know I'm being elevator pitched, I still can't say something like, how do you do that? Because it's very, it's kind of difficult when somebody says that three, those three lines to you to say, oh, that's cool. It does, you know what I mean? There's, you've got it, you feel like you have to follow on. And when you go into a conversational elevator pitch later where you say, well, do you know how many people sort of, you know, go out and start business for themselves because they're looking to leave a legacy or, you know, they're looking to create something for themselves and have that freedom to, you know, work on a beach in Bali if they want or Thailand in your sake. And then, you know, but they end up or they wind up struggling financially or struggling to get clients and starting to lose confidence in themselves. And as a result, you know, they're really starting to wonder whether or not they should go back to work. Do you know anybody like that? Mm. And, you know, somebody will say, uh, you know, they're going to say, yeah, of course I know somebody like that. I'm like that. And then you get to have a conversation again on their invitation because they've told that you that they have that problem mm. and then you can move forward into the conversational level of your pitch. So that was just a taster of, you know, what else you can do to make it even better. But focus on that three part first because if you're not doing that, 
trust me, that's going to 3x your sales straight away. Interesting, interesting. Well, there's a couple of things to point out here, but I think one of the first ones is that to go back to that feature versus benefits idea is that to say I'm a business coach or I'm, you know, I'm a copywriter, that's really just a feature. You know, my feature is that, well, I coach people or I write copy or I sell stuff. You know, whereas it comes to, no one really cares about the feature. You know, if, if in a perfect world, if there was no you know, competitors, no marketing, no advertising at all, and there was only one person who did you know, each specific thing in the world, it would work fine. Because everyone's just going to be like, well, I'm looking for a coach. All right, well, he's the coach. I'm looking for a copywriter. He's the copywriter. You know, whereas in a competitive marketplace, there has to be that differentiation. And that's where the feature doesn't matter anymore because there's thousands of people who have the same, there's thousands of coaches. So what's the difference between them? So there's no, no, one, no one's really looking for a coach. They're looking for something specific, which is where that benefit comes in, which is when you, when you say that, it's kind of interesting. This is why I love sales and marketing is because when it's done well, people know it's happening. They know it's an elevator pitch. And uh, it's not as though it's so good that you're, manip- you know, you're, you're so good at manipulating them. It's more a case of sales when done right, it's perfectly natural because you're just tapping into like if you have a problem if someone really wants to quit their job and build a business and move to Thailand then if someone says well I know how to do that and he's you know he's why I'm trustworthy and here's you know some case studies there's no reason why they wouldn't you know assuming they're convinced there's no reason why they shouldn't do it if that's what they want to do and there's nothing wrong with being sold that because that's what they want in the first place so there's this issue of sales not a bad thing at all and doing that elevator pitch if that's what someone wants they're going to feel great they're not going to be resistant to it at all because that's what they want. Well, that's exactly right. And I mean, people have forgot. I mean, people think sales is a dirty word. I mean, in Peter Thiel's book, uh, Zero to One, one of the creators of PayPal, he Mm. talks about the fact that even though these organizations know that sales is the lifeblood of their organization, they almost hide the fact that they have to sell in any of their presentations. Like it's the the sleazy thing that they do behind Mm. their corporate branding. And that's ridiculous. The, The term to sell means to serve. And what you're really doing is you're presenting people with something that they may need to improve their life. The problem is that people, you're not serving somebody by providing business coaching. You're serving somebody by helping them, as you said, learn the disciplines that or the skill sets that they need so that they can go and work from a beach in Thailand. Mm. So the core, to, to truly serve someone, and I always say, you know, I never call myself a salesperson. I call myself a consultant. And the reason for that is that if I don't truly understand what you need and what benefits you're looking for, and I start presenting the products and services that I offer, then I'm not being a consultant, I'm being a salesperson. So I always start by asking a lot of questions because to truly serve somebody, I need to know a lot of information. So whenever, you know, the elevator pitch is one thing because what I'm really saying is if you're kind of struggling in business and you kind of want to excel by getting lots of customers and you really don't think you can sell, then come talk to me because I'll help you. Mm. Now, now you're interested, how do you do that? Well, let me ask you a lot of questions first to make sure that I can serve you. That's what a consultant does, okay. right? Where a salesperson will say, I'm a coach. And they'll say, oh, I'm not really interested in a coach, but have you thought about this? Well, let me read you the brochure of features that I can provide. You know, I can increase your productivity, your, you know, your profitability. Okay, cool. Every coach says that. What unique message do you have that you can deliver that will actually help people and provide a benefit? Yeah, I like it. I like it. So one direction to go in here, one thing I want to know, and I think the listener's probably a bit, little bit curious about, is going to be examples. So we've, like, we've talked about a lot of examples for if you're a business coach or if you're a copywriter, how can, yeah, you can, you know, have that elevator pitch that, that puts you as, you know, different, that niche differentiation. So what about if you were, like, what are some other examples probably from, like, unrelated, you know, niches or yeah. businesses? Yeah, sure. So let's, let's look at insurance just because we had that one on the table before. You know, if, for instance, um, for people that are in Australia, they'll know of a massive flood that happened in Brisbane. And a few months later, we found out that a lot of those post cut on their insurance policies and they found out that they weren't insured for flood damage that came in from the ocean. And they had proved that it came from the ocean. So all these people found out that they weren't insured and they couldn't get their houses done. So if I was an insurance salesperson, you know, I might, be, I might be saying something like, I help people that are trying to save money on insurance find the right policies that are going to give them the security that they made the right choice, even if they don't have a lot of money, right? So what I'm really trying to do there is I'm, I'm trying to highlight, you know, every part about what I do. It's all about saving money, but they still want that security, that safety net. And everybody knows that, you know, if you get one, you lose the other one. And so they're going to be forced to say, how do you do that? Because they're going to, they're going to be assuming that that's not possible. 
when I bring it up as a conversation, I'll be like, you know, you know how so many people really want to save money on their insurance, but you know, they've seen what happened in Brisbane and all the floods and they're just not willing to take that risk and lose their family home, but they just don't have that money. Do you know anyone like that? Do you know what I mean? You you get people in that conversation. Well, yeah, I know everyone that's trying to save money on insurance, but there's no way I'm going to take that, that risk. Mm. Now we can have a conversation. A, another good example, and I'm just trying to think of an, an industry that – I'll give you an example. Building is a good one. In, in, in Australia and in a lot of countries now, builders are in short supply. Okay, We're building lots of houses. And if I wanted to talk about selling building, I would say, do you know how most people want to build their family home? Or do you know how most people you know, want to do a subdivision? Uh, however, they always find, now we're identifying the problem, they always find that most builders you know, never get back to them. They never get a quote. So, you know, what they're really looking for is somebody that can really help them achieve, you know, getting it done on time, mm. right? Do you know anyone like that? If we're doing it as an elevator pitch, we would say, I help people that want to get their houses built, even if they've had three or four builders already that haven't called them back, mm. right? So, you know, very, it's very strict, very strict guidelines on the elevator pitch. You know, it's, it's three steps. You know, I help people, I, all people, right, help, you know, I help them find somebody to can do their house for them even if you know they've had no sex success before right mm. so you're really putting it in finite guidelines and you know we can go through lots and lots of examples but the core ideology is you know when i said all people because obviously we've just picked this on the cuff helping all people is a very you know it's not a specific message it's like saying i sell ice Hmm. It doesn't give you that anything unique. Like if I wanted to do, if I wanted to sell ice and I wanted to put it in an elevator pitch, you know, I could say I help snow cone produce, you know, snow cone service shops get the best ice possible for their consumers, even if they seem to always have a machine that doesn't work. Hmm. Right. Because everybody know, well, you know, I've actually consulted with the snow cone sales company, but uh, <laughs> the, the, what, what the, the common objection they have is, yeah, but my machine, it's my machine's problem. Machines are too expensive to replace. Hmm. And funnily enough, you can actually create ice that's easier to shred. Hmm. So, you know, there's lots of different ways to do it. But I mean, it's really about following the same the, the three step strategy, which is I help segment. And the smaller you make that segment, the less people it speaks to. But again, if you speak to everybody, you speak to nobody. So speak to that unique segment. And obviously, if you go to a different, a, a, a few different networking events, you can have a few networking spiels and you want to make sure that your networking spiel is the most applicable to the events that you're going to. Mm. But pick a few segments, don't pick more than a few. Then what is the unique benefit that you provide them or what is the unique problem that you solve? And then what's the most common objection that they have? Okay, and it's not one of these things that you just think off the cuff. Like you could say, you know, for business coaches, the most common benefit that I guess we could talk about is that you help create systems within the business. And the core benefit of that is, you know, you increase productivity. Okay, now increasing productivity, how differentiated is that compared to what most business coaches talk about? Mm. It's not that differentiated. So you want to go that one step further. For instance, if I said I'm a sales coach and I help people create a sales system or feel comfortable with a sales system, people aren't going to see that as exciting. So I talk about the fact that I create rapid growth. And for all of my clients, I mean, I've got a, a ghostwriter and this is, you know, where you get to tell these stories when people ask, how do you do that? I have a ghostwriter I worked with that, you know, made $25,000 last year out of one, one ghostwriting gig within six weeks of working with me, made $80,000 out of three jobs. Mm. You know, so as long as you can deliver it, that core message, you know, I create rapid growth is what they want. You're doing them a service, but you need to break it into those elements or you just won't speak to them properly. Mm. I love this. I'm actually making notes right here. After this, I'm going to get to, uh, I'm going to head over to Starbucks. I was, I was already planning to do it, but uh, this is very timely. I'm going to sit down and sort of, you know, map out this, uh, this elevator pitch. I like it. Well, it's, it's funny. It's funny. I learned this um, at a seminar and I can't even remember who I was listening to, but I would have been 16. Mm. And my parents took made me sit in a seminar. You know, they went to one of those three day weekends. I'm sure everyone's received those free tickets to a seminar where they yeah. speak for an hour and then they try and sell you something. Yep. And I got, you know, I got roped into sitting on one of those. And funnily enough, I actually really quite enjoyed it. But I learned this networking spiel at that event. 
And I had no use for it because I was a little introverted kid. I had a reading speed of a sixth grader when I was in high school. Mm. And, you know, I had never thought I was ever going to have any need for it, but I'd written it down. And I, you know, years later when I worked out and started my, my own businesses, I'm like, I need to talk about this. And I remembered that it, it was written down somewhere. And for some reason I'd kept it. And then all of a sudden I've now taught it for so many people. But, you know, I don't spend so many people say, I need to create an elevator pitch. And they sit down with a pen and paper and they write it down. And you, want, you, you wouldn't be surprised if I said they spend probably less than five minutes figuring it out. And then they use this elevator pitch at every networking event for the next 10 years without working on it another time. How many hours do you think they spend delivering this networking pitch or this elevator pitch? Hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. So the one rule that I have is spend more than five minutes doing it. Sit down, work out what true benefit you deliver. And if your customers... Sorry, the best people that will know this is your customers. Like, feel free, pick up the phone and say, look, you know, you know, if you, John, you were my customer, I'd pick up the phone and I'd say, John, listen, I really appreciate the fact that you've been my customer for the last 10 years and I really appreciate, you know, that we've got a great friendship and, you know, we've been working together that long. However, there are so many other sales niche marketing and differentiation organizations out there. Why exactly do you work with me? And they'll respond with something like, well, because you're always so energetic and inspiring or because, you know, you really help me write, re write really great copy or you know, I wouldn't know the first thing about what you would say. Mm. And neither will most people when they sit down to write this elevator pitch. However, what I can tell you is when you, can th when you think about who you help, genuinely your best or the, the people that you help, if you look at your customer set, it'll be those people because they, they're still your customers. So you'll probably find they come from a few different industries, but they're, you know, not that many wide ranging or they'll have similarities. So that's who you help. That's step one. Step two, what benefit do you provide? Pick up the phone and ask them. So many people are scared to ask why somebody's their customer like they're going to decide not to. Every time they pay your bill, they decide whether or not they're going to still pay you. Mm. So pick up the phone and ask them and appreciate them. They'll appreciate it. They'll probably up their spend with you next month. Yeah. So ask them why. That's your benefit. And then ask them the next question, which I love the most, which is when you first sat down with me, what were you thinking? What was the one reason in your head for why you probably didn't want to do work with me? There's your even if. And what you'll find is most people won't have to ask their customer that because it's also the reason most people give them for why they don't buy their service in the first place. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's a pretty it's a pretty simple it's a pretty simple strategy. I mean, this this isn't rocket science. I'd love to say it was 27 steps because then people would have to pay me for hours and hours and hours. Yeah. But realistically, we can do this in an hour session of customization and what I tell you like now you you guys have now got the formula. You could do this with y yourself as long as you spend the hour I would spend with you. If you only spend 5 minutes because I'm not there with you telling you to spend the hour, mm. then it's not going to be as good as I could make it for you. Mm. One thing I've noticed too is being in business for a few years now with, uh, with this marketing stuff is it's one thing to kind of sit down for five minutes or, or an hour or however long you sit down for and do this sort of, you know, an exercise like this but, or even go and talk to people and what will happen is you come up with something, whether you do it just by sitting down in Starbucks or, or going and having a conversation with people but what's going to happen over time is it's going to shift and it's going to evolve and as you bring in more data and feedback just by working and, you know, working with people, you're going to get a clear over time if you stay in the same business and the same market over time, you're going to get the, the picture of who you are and what you do and who you help is going to become clearer and clearer. So what happens is that that message gets more and more and more refined. Well, look, definitely I agree with you. However, I would say one proviso, if you stop for a second and reflect on what you do, because so many people are busy and working day to day and they never look outside that. They're so busy working inside their business, not on it. Yeah. And what I commonly say with a lot of business coaches that are worried when they're first starting about whether or not they're going to be able to help a client, I can generally say, depending on what they charge, that they can more than pay for themselves by actually just physically being there and making the business owner work on their business rather than in it for that hour or two that they're, they're there. They don't have to do any more than that than be the person's babysitter and make sure that they work on their business. And this is the advice I give to all business owners. Mm. Before you get a coach or even though you've got a coach, spend some time yourself physically working on your business. Write the elevator spiel. Think about who you work with. I mean, you talked about the USP, the unique 
sales proposition. When you're doing that, if most business owners don't know what that is. Like when I talk about people that have, you know, got an organization, I ask what their vision is and they're like, oh, that's something fuzzy that, you know, I, don't, I didn't really work on. Well, no, it's something you want your customers, something you want your employees and something you want to get behind. And we go right through, you know, smart goals and setting those visions because it's got to be something that w- makes you wake up every morning and run to want to go to work. Yet most people don't have one. Mm-hmm. When I ask people about their sales strategy and their sales system, they say to me, oh, you know, I just go and talk and whatever comes out of my mouth is what I say because I'm trying to be unique with customers. And I'm like, well, what you're basically saying is you have no strategy. You've got no process for doing it, but you're happy to spend hours and hours and hours going out and seeing clients, writing proposals, and all the rejection that comes with that being told no just because you don't want to spend a few hours writing a script and then learning it and embracing it like an actor would when they portray a script so that you can deliver it spot on every time. I like it. I like it. So... We're right on time here. So tell me a bit about this podcast and uh, what you're up to and what the next step is if someone wants to uh, learn more about you or even work with you. Well, it's funny. I Look, primarily I'm a sales niche marketing and differentiation coach. That's, that's what I do. However, I get so many organizations ask me to come in and work with them. This has been for over a decade now. They want me to come and create rapid growth. And the first thing I do, I come in and I have a look at their business and they've got customer complaints. They've got, you know, they may be signing up a thousand clients, but 20% of them, they've got paperwork errors. They send the wrong products out to 5% of them. Their, their business is all over the place. It's, there's no solid foundations. So what I have to do is I have to say, hold on a second. Let me coach you how to build your business on solid foundations first. Once we've done that, we'll create rapid growth. It doesn't take very long, but we have to do it first. The next step is once we create that rapid growth, I still have to coach them as a business coach to how to fix all of the things and issues that come along the way when you get that sort of rapid injection of sales into your business. Mm. So because, look, I was an introverted kid. I, I, I had 93 doors before my first sale. I was not an extrovert. I definitely didn't have the gift of the gab. And I learned by systemizing every single part of what I did into a process. And I took that into business coaching as well. So for over a decade, every time a customer called me and said, I want to talk about this tomorrow, or or change what they were doing the next morning before I went out and saw them, I would create a worksheet or a template to run through with them because I felt that you should never have to do things more than once. And if you have a business coach that sits down with you and says, what would you like to do with me to, uh, what would you like me to go through with you today? Well, then you're like, well, you're supposed to be in control. How would I know what I'm supposed to do to fix my business? Isn't that what I pay you for? Mm -hmm. So I would have a template. So over the last 10 years, I've spent you know, I've created about 155 of these templates that I perfected over that time. And during this podcast, which is called betterbusinesscoachpodcast.com, you know, you'll find it on iTunes just by typing in better business coach. Um, What I've created is I'm giving away basically all the ideology and all the training you'll need to create those most engaging client sessions you could possibly have. Basically, because I understand what it's like to have to learn all the things you need to learn and, you know, create all of the things you need to create while trying to go out and find customers. So I'm doing all the work so you don't have to. But on top of that, I'm also giving away all of the worksheets that I use, actionable worksheets you can physically take out and use with your clients. And they're all downloadable from my website, matthewpollard.guru uh, or betterbusinesscoachpodcast.com. Uh, and I've also got uh, spoke about um, a special offer that I'm, I'm doing for your listeners, which is if you type in matthewpollard.guru forward slash John, you'll get access to the five worksheets that I start with. It's the, the ones that you use when you're trying to transition a prospect into a client. It basically takes from, I don't know if I want business coaching to, oh my God, please help me. You can see I have lots of problems. And then the first four worksheets that you'll actually use with your client to open up all of those problems and start helping them. Uh, for a business owner, these are great worksheets as well because it will also allow you to start. If you know there are a lot of business owners, and if you can afford it, you should get a business coach because even I have one. Because just talking about your business and utilizing them for a different perspective is awesome. But for those people that can't afford business coaching just yet, it's a great opportunity to actually step back and work on your business and coach yourself until you get to that point. Mm, I like it. I like it. So MatthewPollard.guru/slash/john. All of the links to that in the show notes at uh, thecommended.com under the uh, episode. Matthew, thanks for coming on the show, man. More than welcome, mate. I had a ball.
Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you want to discover more insider tips, tricks, and secrets about driving sales with email marketing, sign up for daily email tips from the autoresponder guy. Go to dropdeadcopy.com slash podcast, sign up, confirm your email address, and I'll send you daily emails on how to improve your email marketing and make more sales via email. You'll find out why open rates don't matter and the seven-letter word that underlies all effective marketing and much more.